DiscerningHearts.com presents The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. Dr. Bunsen serves as the faculty chair of the Catholic Distance University. He is also a senior fellow at the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. He is the author or co-author of over 45 books, including the Pope Encyclopedia, the Encyclopedia of Catholic History, the Encyclopedia of Saints, the Encyclopedia of U.S. Catholic History, and Pope Francis. Dr. Bunsen serves as a senior contributor for EWTN. The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom, with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Dr. Bonson, thank you for joining me again. Wonderful to be with you, as always, Chris. Today we talk about someone who really, I mean, this is an extraordinary doctor of the church, isn't he? He, uh, he stands, I think, as truly one of the towering figures uh, among the doctors. And when we think of the individual talents of the doctors of the church, one of the ones that we immediately consider is their ability to teach the faith and to proclaim the faith. And if that's the case, then St. John Chrysostom has to stand at the, near the very top of the list of the doctors of the church for his eloquence, uh, for his fearlessness in proclaiming the truths of the faith, and also his fearlessness in living the faith and calling on others to do the same. His name, of course, is more an indication of how he was thought of by those around him when we say Chrysostom. And we're not talking about a location, are we? No, we're not. We're, we're talking about uh, an honor given to him by virtue of his talent and his, his name, of course. Uh, what does it mean? It means the golden mouthed. It, it means one who was so brilliant in speaking that it was as though he was giving gold uh, every time he spoke. And uh, Chrysostomos from the Greek uh, was actually presented to him uh, either soon after his death or, according to some sources, even during his life. Let's talk about the beginnings of his life. Where is he from? Well, what we know quite a bit about uh, him is that he was uh, in, born in a city that uh, we've talked about a number of times, with the doctors, and that, of course, is in the great city of Antioch uh, in Syria. And here was uh, one of the places where the name Christian was first used. And we know that his parents uh, were well established in the city. His father was some sort of a military soldier. He was, a, he was an officer. Uh, probably by the name of Secundus, uh, and his mother, uh, whom we're going to be speaking more, uh, was Anthusa. And his father died soon after his birth, and significantly then, he was raised by his mother uh, in the faith. And she did two things for him that were very important. One was to instill in him an abiding love for the faith, but the other was to utilize... Uh, her various connections and friendships in the city uh, to guarantee that her son received uh, as brilliant a career as you could possibly lay out for one of your children, uh, especially uh, his education uh, under one of the, the greatest of the last of the pagan teachers of the ancient world uh, by the name of Labanius. What would that education be comprised of? Yes, well... As we've uh, talked with some of the other doctors, Antioch was uh, a remarkable place of learning during this period. I mean, we're, we're talking about somebody uh, who was born around 347. So the Christian faith had just overcome the Roman Empire, and Antioch was the greatest city of the East certainly uh, in terms of the Syrian provinces and what we think of now is that vast stretch of, of land, of the Holy Land. And educational opportunities there were deep and rich. 
And one of the best ways to be educated was uh, under uh, those who could provide for you uh, knowledge in languages, literature, and then especially in rhetoric. Now, why was rhetoric important? Well, in the ancient world, and this was especially true uh, even in the empire that had been Christianized, the ability to speak and to speak well, to make arguments, to debate, uh, to compose yourself, and then to present your thoughts and ideas were crucial uh, for being respected and also for participating in the great public life of the age. In other words, political advancement uh, certainly was helped by your family connections, uh, by your intelligence, and by your education. But without an ability to speak publicly, to hold forth in a public setting, especially a public political setting, you would not advance very far. And what Labanius discovered very early on, as he taught this young man, was that this John was truly gifted. In, in point of fact, while Libanius helped guide the, the talents of this young man, he soon considered him to be a student uh, unmatched by any other he ever had. And Libanius, I think, really looked at, at this young man as his successor, as the greatest teacher and rhetorician uh, in the whole of the Roman Empire. And that really tells you something. It certainly does. It tells us that he probably was in high demand fairly early in his years. Uh, he was. And it was uh, to Libanius's great lament that as John's skills developed, so too did his faith and his love of Christianity. So what happened basically was that John took these immense skills in rhetoric, in his uh, knowledge of the literature of the age, and also his incredible command of the Greek language, and combined that with the study of theology, with a deep prayer life, with a, a love for the church. And as was typical for the time, uh, John was baptized later than we think of today. And so Libanius probably was, had held out hope that somehow his student would, in fact, embrace uh, the dying pagan culture and succeed him. And he, it is said that uh, Libanius, uh, according to a Christian historian by the name of Sezomen, said on his deathbed that John truly would have followed him if, quote, the Christians had not taken him from us. The statement by Libanius, I think, is also a powerful indicator of the growing allure of the Christian faith, uh, but also the inability of pagan culture to keep up with it that it was no longer simply enough to have a career in rhetoric, to look for political opportunity uh, through your skills as a speaker. There had to be something more, and Christian culture was offering all of that uh, to the best and the brightest minds of a new generation and then every generation that followed. I mean, we see in a way, similarly, uh, the development of Augustine, who had all of these opportunities to be the greatest living pagan mind of his age, but it wasn't enough. Why? Because the Christian faith allows you to come fully into who you are called to be by, by God and by Christ. And that's exactly what happened with, uh, with John. And so, like others who were going to follow him, other great minds, he abandoned any thought of being uh, a great pagan scholar and instead embraced everything that the church had to offer. And that included then studying under another of the great minds of the era, uh, a man by the name of Diodore of Tarsus, who had helped to reestablish uh, the school of Antioch. In the 
great early church, there were two main centers of learning in the Eastern Empire. One was in Antioch and the other was in Alexandria. They were rivals of a sort. And John embraced everything that he could learn from Diodore and also from the entire school. And he combined that then with a desire to find the perfection of the virtues in, in his own life. And that included uh, the commitment personally to rigorous asceticism and a desire to live away from the world to become a hermit. Let's talk once again about that incredibly strong presence of his holy mother mm -hmm. and how that would affect him. I mean, would you say her influence and her requests of him were as compelling and as heart-tugging for him as those of his teachers? Yes, I think they were. Um, as we've been talking, uh, Anthusa gave to him uh, this love of the faith. And I'm convinced personally that it was that upbringing that persuaded him, maybe from the beginning, uh, that the life of being a pagan rhetorician uh, in a kind of dying, moribund pagan culture was never going to work for him. But more than that, uh, Anthusa, I think, saw him as he was growing up as somewhat unfinished. And what I mean by that is that his spiritual life was developing rapidly. And there were things that he wanted to do, places that he wanted to go. But she used her motherly instincts to keep him from flying off too early. And so, uh, out of dutiful love for her, uh, his widowed mother, uh, he did not do these things. Instead, he devoted himself to that rigorous asceticism, to the life of prayer, of abstinence, of fasting, of totally giving himself to things like committing the Bible to memory. In other words, he, he learned the entire New Testament. And he barely ever slept. And as a result of these practices, of course, he, he ended up with very severely damaged health. But it was part of this whole formation of him. And I think his mother had the, the central part to play in that. So that when the time came that his reputation continued to expand because of the people who came to hear him speak, who wanted to hear him speak, he was ready. And his mother sort of held him in check long enough for him to really develop into the person I think she saw he could be. He would not be baptized till he was 18 years old. Even in that, that situation, that was not an unheard of custom of that time, delaying baptism. Yes, that, that's correct. Uh, part of it is uh, the, the desire to live the Christian faith fully and completely. And at the time, that meant, in other words, so deep a respect for the, the sacrament of baptism that you wanted to make sure that uh, you were up to the task. Uh, that's part of it. The other is the idea of putting things off until you're truly ready spiritually. And of course, we look at the, the theological aspects of that somewhat differently today in terms of uh, the uh, entrusting the young people, our young, into baptism as early as possible. But for those in that era, that was the custom. But once he was baptized, uh, it's fascinating to chart the fact that he, he was somebody who was baptized in 368, and within a very short amount of time, he was uh, installed as a lector in 371. And from there, he attended a, a kind of seminary in Antioch uh, with another group of uh, young men who most of whom became bishops across the Eastern Church. And then he... Uh, continued his education under Diodore of, of Tarsus, 
And then, of course, uh, he withdrew. He entered into the Eremitic life um, in, at a, on a nearby mountain and then ultimately lived in a cave. So we're seeing, as we have seen with, with other doctors, this movement toward such hard asceticism. But that, for them, wasn't the end of the journey, as it was for so many of the hermits of their age. But it was simply preparation. Christ's preparing them for a much bigger task. I'm recalling that scene in the scriptures in the Old Testament where Elijah is seeking to hear God's voice and he ultimately hears it in the still quiet. It's not in the it's not in the roar, it's not in the thunder, it's not in all those things. Of course I'm paraphrasing yes, it quite exactly. literally, but it seems as though in this particular case it would have the effect on the one who would end up leaving and becoming known as the golden mouth one. Yeah, that's exactly true. Here was um, the greatest orator of his age out in a cave in the desert. It, it, there seems to be a kind of disconnect there uh, to, the, uh, to the secular world. This would be such, quote, a waste of talent. And yet, here was somebody who could speak in a manner that was greater than theoretically almost anyone in the history of the church, but he wasn't ready yet to speak. He was still being fashioned so that when he spoke to the world, he would have something truly profound to say uh, to match his ability and how he said it. And there I think the illness that struck him uh, forced him out of the monastic life and into what I think he found to be his true calling. Yes, he loved the monastic life. He loved the, the tranquility, the quiet, the ability to concentrate. But he was at heart a priest. And he was at heart somebody committed to the pastoral care of souls. And he wrote, in fact, that given a choice uh, between serving the church in that fashion and remaining a monk, uh, he said that he would prefer the pastoral care of souls a thousand times to the other. Could we talk about that time where he would meet an emperor? Yes. Well, as we chart uh, the life of John Chrysostom, what we find is that he was ordained a deacon in 381, he became a priest in 386, uh, and then was noted for his preaching in, the, city, in the, the city's churches. And now we're talking about some beautiful churches. His preaching, his homilies, soon gathered immense crowds, and, and he covered all of the gamuts that one would expect, uh, in particular against the Arians. But he was also instrumental in helping to save countless lives. As you had in the year 387, what was called the Revolt of the Statues, taxes had been levied. And people, as was their custom at the time, expressed great displeasure by destroying statues, in this case of the emperor. And... <laughs> The, the wrath of emperors of that time was, of course, very severe. And in this case, Emperor Theodosius. And Chrysostom gave 22 separate homilies called, now historically, the homilies on the statues, in which he compelled all of the people of the city to repent, to convert. And it was on the backs of, this, of these homilies, uh, by virtue of these homilies, that he was able to spare the city uh, the full brunt of the wrath of the emperor. So we're seeing in this one figure already somebody not only who could influence the life of his time, but who could also uh, stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with emperors. We saw this, of course, uh, uh, with Ambrose uh, in his 
ability to speak directly to emperors. And, of course, Chrysostom's reputation based on this just continued to expand. And it was as a result, to some degree, of these homilies that, in short order, when the time came, uh, he was promoted. And the promotion took him not simply to a place of great prominence, but to the most prominent position in the church in the Eastern Empire, and that, of course, as head of the See of Constantinople. Should we talk about the importance of Constantinople? I mean, what could we relate it to for those who are unfamiliar with the uh, gravitas of this, this particular city? Sure. Well, with the division of the Roman Empire at the early part of the 4th century, so really from the time of Constantinople's birth under Constantine the Great, obviously the city was named after him, Constantine intended for this new capital in the east to rival Rome. In fact, it was called the New Rome. And it was positioned, ideally, in Constantine's mind, right on the bridge on the Bosporus between Europe and Asia. What we now think of today as Istanbul in Turkey. It was immediately a gathering place for the most powerful in the Eastern Empire and realistically across the whole of the Roman Empire. As the Western Empire in the 4th century and beyond began suffering from Gothic invasions, Germanic invasions, and as the city of Rome was in the West gradually eclipsed by another rising city in the West of Mediolanum or Milan, Constantinople became the de facto city, capital city, chief city of the whole of the Roman Empire. So that gives us uh, sort of the political sense of it. But Constantinople also became the greatest trading center in the West. And the city was one that was also intended from the start to be truly Christian. It was a vast city of churches. It was also the city of imperial administration. It was lavish, it was wealthy, it was intended to be a place of prosperity and of power. And whoever was in charge of this city was in a position to enjoy uh, both the wealth and the, the status that the city brought. What would the reception of his arrival be like for him? Well, there were many who uh, knew of his reputation, and there were others in Antioch who were very unhappy uh, with his departure. He was a, a beloved figure in Antioch, and it was said that he had to depart his city in secret uh, mm. because uh, such a move, uh, leaving the people of Antioch, would cause such uh, unhappiness and, and actual unrest. We have to remember that uh, John had just helped to save much of the city from the wrath of an emperor. And so he was seen as a fairly valuable figure, uh, but he was also, in all seriousness, a, a, a beloved one. And so his arrival in, in Constantinople uh, was greeted uh, with considerable interest on the part of the imperial court. Here was somebody who came with a very high reputation. And right from the start, he made it clear that he was going to be a very different kind of archbishop, a very different shepherd over Constantinople. Why? Because he did not want a kind of a massive celebration uh, to accompany his appointment and then, of course, his, his elevation, his consecration. He did not want to be the center of great attention. Instead, uh, he went out to the poor. He wanted the, the wealth of the city to be used to take care of the poor. He preached from the very beginning on the need to have love for the poor, to be Christ-like in our embrace of poverty. And from the start, much as he did in, in Antioch, 
he called on the people of the city from the lowest to the very highest to reform themselves. He complained almost from the start about the conspicuous consumption, the overabundance, the ridiculous displays of wealth and power and pomp among the wealthy and also among the clergy and, of course, at the imperial court itself. So he began in to use the term, in a very radical way, uh, because, of course, the gospel is rather radical. And this offended some and really began playing out a drama that would continue all the way from when he was first appointed in the fall of 397 to 10 years later with his death. Well, need yet another episode to be able to talk fully about so much of his teaching, of his legacy. I'm so looking forward to continuing our conversation about St. John Chrysostom. Thank you so much, Dr. Matthew Bunsen. Looking forward to it, Chris. You've been listening to The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. To hear and or to download this episode, along with many others, go to discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of discerninghearts.com. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Join us next time for The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom, with Dr. Matthew Bunsen.